My name is Reagan Barr, interviewing retired Commanding Sergeant Major Barr on the changes that he has seen through the military. Okay, let's start with what led you to join the United States Army? Originally, I went to go join the United States Navy, but they would not take me because I was 17 years old at the time. And so the United States Army side of the house would take me at 17. What was your guys' mindset and like basic? What did you guys like act like? When I arrived in basic training, the Iran hostage situation in 1980 and 81 had resolved but they were our main focus, the Iranian military. So our mindset was focused in on two components. One, the Iranian regime, and the second part was the Soviet Union and the possibility of a war in Europe. Do you, when you um, started seeing new recruits come in, did you see a difference in their mindsets? When I arrived to, or when I achieved the rank of sergeant and staff sergeant was the first time that I started to notice the difference in the conceptual ideas of those that were joining the military. When I joined, we had just come out of the Rand hostage situation and we were only approximately less than six years removed to the end of Vietnam War. So most of my non-commissioned officers and officers were all Vietnam vets. By the time I became a staff sergeant, my generation had not been in a conflict up to that point. So we started looking at newer soldiers coming in that were more focused in on education benefits, certain other aspects of um, job training versus focused in on the potential threats of a conflict. Did they act different in like stressful situations than you guys would have? By the late 80s and early 90s as I went back and forth to Fort Benning, Georgia where I went through basic training in AIT uh, I visited uh, one of the uh, training battalions where I had gone through and they had TVs. They had air conditioning. They also had the ability to go use the phone at certain times. They could have snacks in the barracks. Uh, I did not when I went through. There was also uh, restrictions on how they could be disciplined so they came up with this thing called a stress card uh, in the late 80s early 90s so if somebody was a recruit and was feeling stressed out by his drill sergeants or his trainers he could always pull that stress card out and say hey I'm starting to feel stressed out when I went through uh, the difference was we just unbloused our combat boots and would go for a run. They were wearing tennis shoes and sweats. We would still be in our uniform and our white t-shirts and if our white t-shirt after a PT session wasn't brown or totally dirty meant that we didn't put forth a hundred percent effort and so we would redo the training exercise or event until we were completely dirty. And then we would get in trouble because our boots were unbloused and our shirts were dirty. Well, the newer recruits were more focused in on being not yelled at, not being disciplined to the level in which we were used to. So when they would arrive to our units, there was a lack of understanding when we needed something done uh, so the disciplinary actions and processes would begin at the unit of assignment versus through the basic and AIT phase. So I heard you said there were stress cards. Did you see the new recruits try to use that in a real life situation? 
after I had observed that at the basic training and AIT site, and I returned to my unit of assignment, um, I remember we received a couple new soldiers, and they weren't quite as motivated as we were used to, and so I asked one day when I was getting a little tense is a good word I would use, uh, whether I was causing them stress and did they need a stress card. And a couple of the new soldiers, brand new soldiers, said, yeah, uh, okay. So I got some reddish uh, copy paper, cut up a couple little cards, handed them out to the guys. I said, if you ever feel stress, go ahead and pull that out. And we were getting ready to do a helicopter training exercise and we had drawn our equipment, the equipment was laid out, and we were getting ready to do our final check and formation um, before going out to where the helicopters were going to pick us up. And uh, I was standing there doing some checks, and I noticed that one of the brand new soldiers didn't have his 60 uh, millimeter machine gun, and uh, that's it. that was his only weapon. So it was kind of disturbing for me that he had forgot his one weapon. And we were moments away from walking out the back door to go to where the helicopters were going to land and pick us up. So I proceeded to get very upset. And I raised my voice a little bit, a couple octaves. And I said, do you feel stressed? And he pulled out his little card that I had given out. And I said, oh, time out. we got to be calm. So I had all the squad leaders come around. Um, I said, hand me the stress card so I know it's the one I gave you. And I proceeded to tear up the stress card in little pieces, handed it to the other squad leaders. And I said, proceed to chew. And so they all put it in their mouth, started chewing it. As I continued to express my dislike of the fact that he was upset that he had left his weapon, and that I was firmly stressing my concern of his lack of responsibility. So we proceeded to eat the stress card that I had made, and I asked if anybody else in the formation felt stress, and everybody else felt just fine. Okay. Has any of the goals you were taught in basic changed in any way from today? Changed from when I was taught to today. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say it's an avid flow. In other words, when I joined, we had one objective goal uh, that we were being taught. You know, our sense of discipline, honor, uh, integrity, um, intestinal fortitude to drive through whatever uh, roadblocks we had in front. Um, and to not be just self-reliant but relying on others I don't think those goals really ever changed but the emphasis dipped for a while but then when 9-11 happened and we found ourselves in conflicts those same standards were really kind of brought back home to bear because it was important for everybody to be on the same sheet of music okay moving on from those um, has the policy Bill Clinton passed changed the Army in any way, the don't ask, don't tell policy? Well, don't ask, don't tell just basically allowed, hey, we're not going to hold you to account for your actions when you're not around the base or around uh, other soldiers. The rule was you still couldn't do inappropriate conduct. You couldn't cross a certain line. And if you were doing something in your private life, uh, we would not ask and you didn't have to communicate. Uh, that rule worked fairly well to a certain point. When 9-11 happened and we were getting ready to deploy units into the battlefield, a lot of people decided, well, there's this policy, don't ask, don't tell, so I'm going to start telling everything I can so I don't have to go, which then created a problem because now you had some soldiers that were trying to use their 
alternative lifestyle to get out of the necessity of deploying with the units. So we would have to go through a litany of questions and you had to sit there and you had to ask them. And if they answered questions 100% truthfully and to a certain point, you could separate them from the military with a general discharge. But then you would have people that were trying to use it and so it created a discipline issue to get yourselves ready to deploy after post 9-11. Um, so it had an adverse effect over the years of not holding a certain standard and then all of a sudden you need everybody to deploy and now people were trying to use that same policy to avoid deploying. Mm. Which created a problem when you had certain people that you basically had an understanding that they were of a different lifestyle, but now they were throwing it at, in your face to avoid deployment, and you don't have ability to replace that person to deploy. And then you had others that under that policy were gonna go do their job, and they weren't gonna say anything, and we weren't gonna ask anything. So when Obama lifted the ban, did anything change anyway? Uh, yeah, because the regulations and certain policies were not conducive. Um, and so it created even bigger headaches than the do not ask or tell policy was. When he lifted it and everybody could just do everything, then you were dealing with certain disciplinary actions. Um, so it created a negative impact in one way. Um, in other ways, it created uh, some cohesion issues because now things were just being blatantly thrown around. Um, and it became if you needed to discipline somebody and yet you were disciplining them on their conduct and certain morals and ethics then you could be accused of being a bigot, but yet you were trying to instill a certain responsibility and you really didn't care what their personal preferences were. You were looking at the conduct, but now you couldn't even look at the conduct because under his policy, it was conflicting with the other regulatory uh, standards of good order and discipline within the organization. And then he also lifted the transgender policy, which created numerous other issues and problems. What were the type of problems that were caused for lifting the thing? You could be heterosexual. You could be gay. You could be some other status. And as long as you were performing your duties and you were also showing a good moral code and following certain ethical practices, you were okay. If you were of a male gender and a female, uh, both lower and upper rank were to come around you, you had a standard in conduct that you had to follow. But then when the policy got left, it on the other side, if a female approached another female and was unwanted and you tried to enforce the disciplinary aspect or a male to a male, the chain of command would always be called into question whether they were questioning the soldiers for their lifestyle versus the conduct. But if it was a male female, there was never any debate whether the conduct was the issue when two people when one didn't like an advance from another it was inappropriate it was held to a standard that was clearly spelled out in the regulation for a heterosexual male female but when it was female female male male or other gender whatever you want to call them or whatever the government says it is nowadays you would be called out as the command versus their conduct 
because you were questioning whether they were providing good order and discipline in an organization, even if the person was making unwanted advances. You were, the leadership was always called into question whether they were using an alternative point of view versus the fact it was the same standard as if it was male to female. Uh, but leadership would question at times the subordinate leadership of the disciplinary action, wondering whether it was deviating from the ability to allow people to be whoever they want to be, which is not conducive in the United States Army part of the equation, maybe in the Marine Corps uh, equation as well, uh, because the main focus of the Army and the Marines is to close within distance to the enemy and destroy it. It's not there as a social experiment. It's there to break things or to kill things. If that makes sense to you. Yes. So, the transgender thing, they're trying to use the money and military provides them to do the change of their body. Is that, should that not be a thing? Well, once again, if you go into what the regulations and the policies are that they didn't change, they consider it mutilization. Mm. And anybody that either uh, does cutting or any other mutilization or attempted suicide are considered a, a certain status and are considered unfit for military service under the regulation. When they changed the policy towards the about 2015 to 17 to try to allow them to join the military and then immediately asked to do um, the transformation, uh, what you ended up having is if they could uh, be approved for it, you were going to spend a couple hundred thousand dollars of government taxpayer money, then the person would be declared undeployable and unfit for service for up to nine months while the transition happened. So you basically were taking people, enlisting them, spending $80,000 to get them trained and certified in whatever job in the military, assigning them to a unit and immediately not being available for up to nine months to be able to deploy or to serve the unit in its capacity to meet its missions. And you were going to spend, as I said, approximately $100,000 in U.S. taxpayers for the medical procedure. So it basically became a person that joined and could possibly finish their enlistment and never actually do the job in which they were trained to do. So did that cause an issue? Yes because you basically were enlisting people to just do nothing. So until recently, females weren't allowed to do field? No, combat direct um, combat operations. Why was that? It was a statute that was established under uh, military guidance years ago. Women were not part of the regular uniformed force um, even into the beginning of World War II, that's why you had the uh, Women's Army Air Corps, you had the Women's uh, Auxiliary, you had uh, nurses, you had certain uh, statuses, and during World War II, they started integrating them into certain uh, positions and jobs. The direct combat operations were always left to uh, male units, all male units. Um, combat arms are a limited number of personnel out of about 500,000 plus army personnel on active duty, 300,000 uh, National Guard, and about 200,000 
Army Reserve, the total Army combat arms equals approximately only 50,000 of the almost 1.1 million Army. So when people think of the United States Army being this large combat arms guys to carry the rifles and kick in doors and all that, it's actually between 50 and 70,000 total in all three components of the Army. So they basically determine because you have to carry a lot of gear, you basically don't shower, you don't have ability to have regular bathroom breaks and all these other things, that that job would be left to the, the male uh, soldiers. And so all the way into recently, those roles were still left to the male only. Um, Navy uh, has close uh, areas on ships, so they didn't allow women to be in ships until well into the late 80s. Um, and then the concern was in places that we go fight, uh, the cultural differences between what we look at and what they look at would put women in jeopardy in some ways, uh, culturally. So it didn't change right now. They've been slowly trying to integrate it without reducing the requirement. Field artillery guys uh, that actually fire the large 105s and, and 155s, they have to be able to lift a, approximately an 80 pound weight and load it. Um, and they have to do it repeatedly. Infantry guys have to carry normal combat load with rucksack. Uh, the rucksack will weigh between 35 and 65 pounds. The body armor load bearing vest will weigh approximately 27 pounds. Then you have your rifle and that's not counting your ammunition and other supplies you need to carry. So it's not uncommon that you're carrying in excess of 150 pounds and you're doing it over long distances. Infantry must be able to do a full tactical road march of 12 miles in less than uh, three hours with full combat gear on their body. So you basically have to run 12 miles with approximately 80 total pounds to include the 35 pound pack. So the physical endurance and the wear and tear on the body was the reason why most of the combat arms units were restricted to male only. Plus you live long periods of time in remote areas. Um, for like my situation, one, one of the elements in Afghanistan, we lived with our Afghan partners. So we were combat arms guys living on a compound with our Afghan counterparts. We were eating, sleeping, and we were not given a whole lot of comfort and all that stuff. And when we would do helicopter inserts, we were between seven and 12,000 foot altitudes. And you had to carry that gear. Plus, when you're moving from point A to point B in a vehicle, you have to go to the bathroom. You're not stopping the vehicle. You're using a gator bottle. Are the height and weight tables gotten stricter since you've been in? No, they fluctuated. Uh, the height and weight kind of allowed a little more flexibility uh, early on. And as the equipment changed and the physical fitness requirements changed, it would it would modify either up or down. So right now, the body weight mass criteria is still there. It's a little more restrictive. The physical fitness test has gotten tougher again. So when I joined, there were five events, and then it went to three events, and then it went back up now to a multi aspect uh, where it's a lot more physical uh, weightlifting, dragging, tossing, and then a little bit of running and some pull-ups. Um, and so 
when I got in, it was tougher. Then I got a little less, and now it's since I was getting out, it started moving back up towards where it was when I first joined. Why would it fluctuate that way? Well, when I joined, we had come out of Vietnam. We were still looking at a Cold War. And then when the Berlin Wall fell and the Cold War kind of faded away between what was the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc countries, it was determined that we needed to be a little gentler to those that we joined, i.e. we go back to the stress card, we go back to being a little bit less enforcing the standard. Uh, You never would report to a unit out of weight compliance or PT compliance. And then about late 80s, mid 90s, we would get guys that the day they'd arrived from basic AIT, they'd failed the height and weight table and couldn't pass PT test. And so we would have to fix that at a unit level. Nowadays, because of the battles that we had in the Middle East and Southeast Asia, we need fitness. Fitness is a priority. It helps with readiness. It helps with ability to do the job, to carry your weight, uh, carry and drag wounded across the battlefield. So we've now re-implemented higher standards. Is that an improvement, or should they just keep it all level all the way through? Or no, it needs to improve. In what way? The, the direction in which they're going. It's a physical readiness test versus a physical PT test. You have to be able to do lift your own body weight. You have to be able to put the gear on that you're required to carry. You need to be able to move a. 150 to 200 pound person that might be wounded in a combat and drag them across a certain distance or be able to carry them. You don't have time to learn that or figure that out when you're in the battlefield. You have to be ready to do it on day one. So with them modifying and changing to a more tougher standard now, back to almost uh, above the standard in which I first was held to and take away the part that was in the middle of my service, which was really, there was not a standard. It had gotten uh, dramatically low during the 90s. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you would want to talk about? Any changes you've seen personally? Well, as I said, everything's been kind of a flow. I came out into the military at a time when we had gotten out of Vietnam. We had a failed mission in Iran uh, for the hostage rescue. We were lacking some equipment and ammo. We improved upon that. We rebuilt the Spree de Corps. Then we had a little lag where there wasn't the spree de corps because everybody was trying to do social experiments. And now uh, the military has moved back to a responsibility. You have to be physically fit. You have to have some spree de corps. Um, The one thing I would fear as we get ready to no longer have people serving in combat environments is not to focus everything into Oh, join the military and get a college education. Oh, join the military and get a trade and get trained for a job. When I joined, that was not the emphasis. During the late 80s, 90s, that was the only emphasis. In the 2000s, we found that we needed people to be ready to go fight. They have a sense of honor, duty, and courage, loyalty, integrity. Uh, towards each other and towards the United States. We need to keep going on that pathway. And there are times in which all the branches of service have low number of recruits. In other words, they don't, they don't get enough people to join at, on a given year. 
don't lower the standards to just make a number. Because when you get ready to deploy a unit, you could have 100 guys. 100 guys or 100 uh, guys and gals. And the unit gets ready to go. Only 65% of them are ready to go. When we went through the 80, late 80s through the 90s, in the beginning of 2011, um, or 2001, after 9-11, it was not uncommon that the units that were deploying only could muster 60% to 65% of their formation. So that means out of the 100 you needed, 35 to 40 of them were not available. They were out of shape, physically broken, or were not uh, able to be retained in service. So then you were getting ready to deploy a unit and you still had the mission for 100 people, but you only had 65. It doubles the workload and it puts people in jeopardy. And the entire time you're deployed, you're going to lose another 25% to injuries and illness. So don't lower the standards, keep them high. Thank you again for coming and talking with me about the changes you've seen through the Army. Thank you.